welcome to Bios Ventures. Today, we are thrilled to have Will Canestero joining us, the Managing Director of the Washington Research Foundation and WRF Capital. Will, thank you once again for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Let's kick things off. Will, can you share a brief personal introduction with us today? My name is Will Canestero, Managing Director here at Washington Research Foundation. I manage our biotech and life science investments. I also have a couple other uh, jobs where I moonlight. So I'm a faculty member in the UW School of Pharmacy, where I teach uh, meta-analysis, and also in the School of Business, where I teach health innovation. Well, thank you for that intro. Before we dive much deeper, do you mind sharing a brief introduction to WRF for us? Yeah, WRF stands for the Washington Research Foundation. So we're an endowed private foundation based here in Seattle. And our mission is to help technologies commercialize from Washington State research institutions. And we do that through two, uh, two tools. The first is grants. So we make grants to investigators while they're still at the institution to help them de-risk their technologies so they can be ready to spin out or form a license to a larger company. Um, we also do early stage VC investing. So uh, we're helping commercialization for uh, technologies across the spectrum, both within the institution as well as outside. The one uh, unifying factor for those is it's in healthcare life science mostly, um, and then everything's in Washington State. So uh, we define our funnel based on the things that are in our backyard. You no, know, that's phenomenal. And just a quick clarifying question. You said spinning technologies out of universities, and then they have to also be based in Washington State. So it's geographic both in the institution and from the formation of the company. Yeah, so the companies on the startup side, the companies we invest in have to be based in Washington State. In some situations, they don't have IP from a Washington State research institution. Um, but on the granting side, everything has to be a nonprofit research institution. So we're thinking about like the Fred Hutch, Seattle Children's, UW, the uh, places where the technology is being developed for the grant. And then for the companies, we have a broader, the aperture is, is wider um, there. So we can invest in companies where it may not be directly from those institutions. We think it's an interesting technology and um, fits our thesis. That's absolutely phenomenal. And out of personal curiosity, do, do the profits then go back to the foundation to continue investing in new companies? Is this an evergreen model? Yes, we operate as an evergreen model. So Debra Capital is a brand, but there's no separate institution around it. So it's all Washington Research Foundation. Um, we had to start using that brand just because we were being approached to be an LP in someone else's fund as opposed to doing it on our own. Uh, but when we when we do a good job at the granting, we create more opportunities for investment. There's no strings attached to the grant, uh, so it's fully owned and controlled by the university uh, that it came from. Um, and then we invest, we invest on the same terms as other investors, we invest to make money, uh, but instead of going uh, to the directors or to investors in the fund, it goes right back in the pool of capital to make more grants, which allows us to, to do more there. So the two activities feed each other um, and are very synergistic. What an absolutely phenomenal uh, foundation to have in Washington State. So forgive me, I know I asked a few more questions right off the bat, but thank you for those intros. And I think I'd love to dive in now, if it's okay, to your own journey to VC in venture. And so, yeah, no, excited about it. Uh, so from the very beginning, you really charted your own course. As an undergrad at Dartmouth, you created your own major in medical sociology before then completing a master's in medical anthropology at University of Oxford. So from the very beginning, I guess, what brought you to bio healthcare and why create your own major? Yeah, I thought originally I was going to be a physician. I'm from East Tennessee, and so I wanted to go back and be a, a clinician in a rural area. Um, I had a couple of experiences in my undergrad where I was seeing healthcare interventions fail for a number of reasons that had nothing to do with the clinicians, and so got really interested in the context in which technologies come out. And so wanted to learn more about that. And so when I had the chance to study, I was thinking, okay, do I wanna just do um, a set course? Or do I wanna think about the other sort of other factors around healthcare that cause it to be more or less effective? And so um, I combined uh, courses from across the college that touched on healthcare that were in uh, engineering, philosophy, anthropology, sociology. So all these different elements uh, for why healthcare is effective or not as effective as it could be, and had that in combination with like the standard set of pre med courses. And so, we're trying to be um, holistic as possible, as opposed to just having sort of the uh, preset template around it. 
Um, and yeah, it's been interesting. I still, uh, what I've learned from those courses still comes in, into play every now and then. So it's helpful to have that kind of background, that kind of high level before you dive into anything really deeply. No, absolutely. And the power to build your own and recognize what you might need later on. Absolutely uh, phenomenal insight, especially at a younger age as an undergrad. So very impressive. And with that background, with that context, from your master's, you joined Generation Health and became their assistant director of clinical research before then returning to academia at the University of Washington for your PhD and pharmaceutical outcomes uh, research and policy. So what led you into industry and then back to academia and why pharma outcomes and policy? Yeah, it's not something you think you want to do in high school. People don't dream of that as they're uh, graduating at 18. Yeah, so uh, I was coming back from the master's in anthropology. I thought I would get a job in a lab in the Boston area. So my plan was to move to Boston and uh, work in a lab while I was applying to medical school. The um, When I came there, it was uh, 2008, September 2008, and there were some macroeconomic forces happening. So uh, a lot of the health systems in the area, the place, you know, the, in the universities were on a hiring freeze. And so um, there were literally no jobs to be had in that field. Everyone was just on complete lockdown uh, with the financial crash at the time. So I uh, had to be creative uh, and thinking about how I was going to feed and house myself. Um, and so the first thing, you know, I had a number of odd jobs, including, you know, working at a dermatology clinic and uh, doing other sort of random things wherever I could, wherever I could work. Uh, but then I applied to a uh, Craigslist posting, actually, because Craigslist was a thing back then even. Uh, and it was, it ended up, it was very um, ill-defined uh, in the description, but it was a, a marketing role in a biotech company in the area, um, and it was focused on uh, next generation sequencing, and that was a more novel uh, approach. And so uh, we had a, converse, had a conversation with the, with the company there, and it just seemed really interesting. Uh, so I jumped into that. So it wasn't a, uh, a thoughtful approach like, oh, I want to go into industry. This is going to work. It was really just out of necessity. Uh, but when I got into uh, Corellogen was the company that I was working with. Um, a lot of the questions there were just really interesting. You know, so they were thinking about, we have this panel where we can add certain genes in to detect uh, cardiomyopathies and channelopathies. What are the advantages of adding one over another? Uh, when's the point of diminishing returns? Uh, how are we making the case about that to uh, key opinion leaders. So just really interesting questions and very science-based. And so that got me excited about working in startups. And then also there's just the uh, energy that comes from everyone trying to build something together. You know, it's not something that's uh, your, your contribution. You can see the outcome of that pretty directly. And so I really like that um, proximity between the effort and then the um, reward in terms of seeing the company do better. Um, so that, that was how I made that jump originally. Um, and then as that, that company was acquired by LabCorp, the CEO had another, is the kind of the stereotypical serial entrepreneur. He had his next company. He was spinning up in the background as one was getting acquired and he picked some folks to, um, jump into that one. So I was an early employee at Generation Health. And so, um, I've had the, the team there and I was just like really whiteboarding stage in terms of having some really brilliant people uh, work on that with me and just think, okay, where do you want to start? What's our, what's our plan, our vision here? Um, and that was really just a, a really fun time to see that grow. And the in Generation Health was, the premise was uh, that molecular testing at the time was going through this process where health insurers were you know, identifying more uh, tests where there was a high spin, but they didn't necessarily know the evidence around it. So it was a similar trend would have been seen in the 80s with pharmaceuticals. And they thought, is there, is there a play here to be a diagnostic benefit manager similar to how there's PBMs for drugs? So could we be an interme intermediary helping to make sense of this space for payers to understand it and then also maybe generate evidence for um, diagnostic companies that don't have access to enough enough uh, patients or populations to determine the validity of their test. Um, mm -hmm. So um, jumped into that model um, and did a number of roles, but really started um, doing health economics without realizing it. Um, and so we were trying to, we had these programs we were launching, CVS Caremark became our first client. Um, they eventually acquired the company too, but 
that focused us on pharmacogenomics. So how could you use gene tests to make better prescription decisions for folks? And for each program we launched, um, we had to build an evidence case for that. So first off, of the thousand tests you could run, which ones have enough evidence to, to run? Uh, what's the impact of doing that? Can we sell that to someone? Would someone pay for that service to where we're optimizing prescriptions based on this? Uh, and then making the case off of it. But the health economic model there was a really key part of our decision making. So what what is our belief about if we ran this test, how many patients would be influenced? What would the inf what would the effect on health outcomes be? What would the effect on costs be? And so we had to uh, build that case out. And so I was doing these Excel models and I was learning from um, Julie Yu, who is now um, in Andreessen, and Mabel Mara at Castlight, she was uh, in Generation Health at the time too, um, uh, and so they were. They kind of taught me how to do Excel because you don't you don't tend to do big Excel models uh, in undergrad, and I just really liked it. But it was not something that I would have discovered on my own. But then as I was doing more of it, I started looking in the literature and I found other cost effectiveness studies from different researchers. And I just got more into like how would I do this really well, um, and the kept on circling back, back to some of the same researchers. Um, and tried to, to determine, okay, what I'm noticing about the people who, who look like what I want to be when I grow up, uh, if I want to do this, they all have a PhD uh, training. And so if I want to um, grow in this field, that seems the right way to do it. But I want to make sure that I was not just chasing uh, a brand, you know, for the place I was going to go. I want to have a, a fit with a PI because the what I'd heard all along is that um, that relationship is really critical and way more important than the name of the school you're going to. So had a lot of informational interviews like over the course of a year with folks all over the country. And um, UW stood out to me as a place where the people were really pleasant um, and nice to work with. And they're also focused in the same area that I was, which is applying health economic tools to personalized medicine and think about how you optimize that. And so, on a number of fronts, it just seemed like the right fit there, um, and so that's what that's what brought me out here uh, for my PhD. No, uh, it sounds like at that point, safe to say, over the course of your journey, you realized uh, you were taking a step back from pre med. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, no, and, I, and 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 by taking some time, I, I saw my I saw some friends go through that process, and th that became became sort of a Rorschach test about okay, do is this something that I want to do or, or am I doing it because I've been told I should do it? And um, are there other ways I can be involved in healthcare? Uh, you know, applied to schools, got into some, just, but kept on pushing it back. And eventually it's like, okay, this is not the right place for me. This is not the right fit um, because I see the people that are having to do this. And I don't think that I'm there in terms of what they had to go through. And that's what I want to do. Um, so yeah, it, I found a way to be complementary, but not directly in line with, you know, traditional clinicians. No, absolutely. And I think it's a good message to any uh, in the pre-med space listening, even those who are considering med school, maybe taking a gap year. You have other options. <laughs> it's a phenomenal path if it really aligns for you, but you should never feel stuck. Your early training is a phenomenal experience that you can really turn into a career in a lot of different avenues. Yeah, no, I full hardly believe in gap years and time off and trying other things. Even if you go back, I, people have done that and gone back to the MD Anyway, they 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 bring something else to us. I think that traveling right through, you miss the chance to have those opportunities because once you're down the road and you're you're um, in residency, it's kind of hard to pull, pull the brakes on something that's the train's kind of left the station. So, I I definitely encourage people to explore that when they can. And then startups are such a great experience too because you do a startup and there aren't really roles or functions defined. Mm -hmm. And so if you're trying to figure out like what you want to do and what you what you are good at. Um, you're not getting hired into like a marketing role or a tech development role. Like people wear so many hats that you have the chance to explore and experiment with things and see where you fit in an organization. And things like uh, pharmacoeconomics is not something you would know you're good at or like uh, until you have the chance to try it and someone gives you um, responsibility way too early um, and you get to try it out. So continuing in that vein on the uh, healthcare economics side, Shortly after you joined UW, you yourself became a healthcare economics consultant with the Veritech Corporation. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that experience? Yeah, so moved to um, 
Seattle started the work there. Um, health economics, there are a couple big shops that do a lot of work there, but there, you know, a lot of academics also have side businesses where they're doing consulting on a project or two. Um, and also it's it's the 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 membrane is more fluid between academia and industry. There's not as much of a bias against people that have collaboration with industry because the economics is in the title. Um, and so the some of the faculty members had a consulting organization that they ran to do work for a number of different groups. And um, they invited students to participate in those projects as consultants. And so that was just a phenomenal chance to um, get my hands dirty on real projects and see what it was like and also address real world problems. And um, so did that for a number of projects over the course of several years. Um, and it was a really nice complement to the more abstract projects I was doing in my PhD work, I actually like applied, this is useful right now kind of work to an industry partner. And also I think it, um, I think I probably had, even going to startups, I probably had a bias against big industry, um, but you know, working with colleagues that were at Genentech or AstraZeneca, like you just see their framework and you realize that, that you know, we're all playing in the same field for the same goal, which is, you know, getting better therapies out there and making sure they're accessible. Um, and so that was a really important experience too, just having that kind of interaction with folks industry early on. Yeah. And in addition to consulting with Veritech, you also became involved with the Washington Research Foundation as a new ventures fellow and a tech licensing fellow, even while you were in a PhD. So you've been working with the WRF now for quite a while. Yeah, no. So I came out to Seattle and over your first summer, you don't have research obligations. And so they basically say, go off and find something to do. Um, and so a lot of people work in uh, a pharma company uh, for that period of time, going in an HOR group. Uh, I had I applied to some of those positions. Um, I thought, you know, my, my wife and I were interested in going to um, Switzerland. There's a position there, but for a number of reasons, we decided it would be better to stay in Seattle for the summer. Um, and so I looked for opportunities there and I was looking around, I was like, there must be some sort of startup ecosystem here. Like I did that in Boston, Seattle has the UW, there's lots of, um, the science here is really strong. So what does that look like? So I found this fellowship where you could work on the business plan for an early stage technology spinning out of UW. Mm -hmm. So apply to that and they give you a list of technologies that you could work on each summer. And there was one that was an oral enzyme treatment for celiac disease. And my wife has a severe form of celiac, uh, where she has, you know, um, central nervous system uh, symptoms whenever she has even small amounts of gluten. So I saw that. I was like, oh, I, that's, that's, that's a big deal. I'm really excited about that. Um, it turned out that technology was the first spin out from the Institute for Protein Design. So I got the chance to work with um, Ingrid Poltz, who is the uh, scientist working on that and was with her as we were sort of thinking about what the opportunity was uh, in that space. PVP Biologics became the first spin out from, from the Institute for Protein Design. So I got a chance to work with Ingrid Poltz, who was the founding scientific member there. And we pitched a lot of VCs and WF was one of the VCs that we pitched uh, as we were going around. And so it was really great being on the other side of the table and seeing what that experience was like, uh, trying to craft a story around a new technology. Uh, but as we were doing that, I was talking to different groups and I saw WF and I was like, oh, that seems like a really interesting job on that side of the table because you get to see all these different kinds of science. You get to, the variety is there. Uh, there's pattern recognition. And I also really liked the, because I had been a fellow funded by WF during that summer fellowship, uh, working with them. I also knew they had this aspect where they were um, doing some of the, the dirty work upstream of company formation, you know, helping people who have, this is the first time they're doing it, they're learning how it goes. And that seemed really cool to me as well. So I really liked the experience of um, working with crazy scientists who like have this idea they're really passionate about. Um, and I, I, was, I, was, I was turned off by the idea of just trying to be a filter, uh, mm -hmm. just saying, here are the people that we want to bet on and there are people who are not ready yet. We just have to say no to. I like the idea. I like the idea and the concept and the philosophy of identifying people and investing in them and coaching and nurturing that over years, even in some cases and getting them ready for investment as opposed to trying to be more of just a filter and placing bets kind of model of VC. No, I absolutely love that. Definitely strongly resonates. And it really sounds like with WRF, you get to do it all. 
everything from that sort of recognition, nurturing, and support, which I think a lot of VCs enjoy, to the uh, bet placement and selection once you've identified and helped those people move forward. And then on top of that, you're not only uh, offering capital through grants, but also um, as a VC as well. And so that that's really the full gamut. Yeah, no, it's it's nice because we, we identify people who are working on differentiated technologies that if they work, they're going to make a difference. Um, but if they're too early to start a company, we still have something we can do with them. So in, in most situations, uh, people come to us and they have a pitch deck and they've they've gotten a logo, but it's nowhere near what an actual company is. It hasn't been licensed out yet. It hasn't been de-risked. There's no other executives. They don't know exactly where they're going to pursue it forward. And so we can give them feedback. We can also say, well, here's this uh, avenue you can pursue um, in the meantime. So here's a way we can keep momentum on this project. We can test certain key questions because if you, go, if you haven't solved for X, Y, and Z, there's nothing here in the, in the first place. Uh, and doing it through grants means you're not starting the clock on someone else's money. Um, and so it's just, and you're also building value inherently. Uh, and so that's, that's always really great to have that chance to work with people and not just tell them to, to go off and come back if they can figure out something on their own, but to be a partner with them throughout the whole process. And so um, really like that aspect of it. Yeah, and it sounds like you liked it to the point where you consulted with the WRF during your time in grad school and then joined and stayed after to become the managing direct uh, the manager of strategic investments and so at that point no go ahead yeah no i was i was really persistent so i probably had like 10 informational interviews and i gave a seminar on how health economics could be used for venture investing and i had a couple advocates inside so i was just like trying to find ways where i could flirt with being overly to the point of annoying probably just around and how can i be helpful kind of thing like just tell me how i can be involved uh, cause I'm really excited about what you're doing here. So, and that eventually, that eventually paid off. Um, and so it turned into a consulting role, which I th was originally meant to focus on health economic questions, but really quickly changed gears and moved into just diligence on companies. And, um, then we, there was, there was a managing director at the time who was retiring. And so he had a certain area where his portfolio was focused. And so I found a company that was uh, a fit for his portfolio, but he, he didn't want to take it on. And so I wrote up the investment memo and did the projections um, just on my own and presented it to them. I said, hey, I, this isn't necessarily my job. I think this would be a good thing for you guys to take a look at. Um, and I said, that's great. Would you take the lead on it? And so it was one of those things where I wasn't invited to do it, but did it kind of at risk. And I thought I would just, if, at worst case scenario, I'd learn something about it. And that, that, that allowed me to enter into active investing. And then one investment became three, became... 15 became 40 now. So uh, just uh, that's grown organically over over the time. But it was, for all those jumps, it was something where the opportunity wasn't written out in a job description, but I had to sell people on the need to have that position and then why I was the right fit for that position. And so there was uh, a process of talking through that with people and getting them excited about what that can mean. Um, but yeah, I've never, I've never, Besides my one Craigslist application, I've never had luck directly applying to something just off LinkedIn or something else. I uh, believe it or not, similar. I, I applied to exactly one job in the past decade, and that was my role with AstraZeneca. Uh, after which I was hired on internally and in completely um, for for something completely separate. But yeah, it's it's an exciting space. Sorry, please. Yeah, no, I think people people say that all the time. They say like. Oh, I, uh, it's about network or, you know, it's about um, sort of building trust and relationships with people when you're graduating from undergrad. Like that's just such a crazy thing to think about because you don't have any network. You don't know anyone. You don't know how your skills can be useful. And, but you, you know, if you're persistent, I think it pays off over time, just like your, your story is describing, like you, you kind of figure it out as you're going along. And so do you have maybe, and we're going way off, off track here, but I think if, uh, that's if the fun part. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you have a, You've, you've just given some, but do you have any advice for those uh, who might be listening who are earlier in their careers, who might be trying to figure out how to chart their own course, and potentially who are nervous about doing so? Yeah, I think there's a lot of expectations, and most people in biotech or healthcare life sciences, like, you're probably a really um, persistent, hard-driving, you know, intelligent person, like, you've gotten really far already, and there's, there, there's like, some well-worn uh, paths to travel. But I think that um, 
there's benefit early in your career for trying things that are a little weird um, and sort of off the beaten path. And you can do that and not have regrets about trying it and saying it wasn't a fit. Um, but I think that you you don't regret giving yourself an experience trying something different, um, like working in, in a startup or trying a role which is not you're not directly trained for. Um, the, the dirty secret is that a lot of you know early stage roles people are learning on the job anyway, and so I think people later stage roles too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People undersell themselves like they just um, they think well I don't, I don't meet 100 percent of the qualifications so I can't apply to it. They don't they don't put themselves out there and try it. I think it's even especially uh, amplified for scientists because you're so rational you see like oh i'm trained to use the mass spectrometer so i have to find a job where i can use a mass spec and that's what i do as opposed to well what do i know about how i approach a, a problem from using a mass spec that i can take somewhere else and so i think that thinking about thinking broadly about how you can generalize your skills um is really critical and i try and a few things that are a little off the beaten path you generally don't regret uh, and maybe finding uh, some teachers as you were talking about being trained in large excel models wasn't your initial fit but you always have some friends and coaches uh, those who are mentors to you and, and work who can also give you some advice and so yeah yeah i think there's like big m mentors and there's little m mentors right and so there's like people sort of think they have to have the big m mentor like someone who's been in the field for like decades who's going to you know coach them and raise them up. And that's really the minority of the time. I think that most of the time you're looking for someone who's like a half step ahead of you. Uh, mm -hmm. And you say like, they've they've experienced some of what I've done and they're also close enough to it that know what I'm going through. They haven't they've forgotten about how tough it is, the stage I'm at. And so I think finding people that are a year or two ahead of you and have a little bit of experience, it's a lot more accessible and they're going to give great advice. And so I think that you shouldn't, you shouldn't um, get turned off by the fact you can't find that big M mentor right away every time, but just think about, okay, who's around you and their, their peer in some respects, they've also gone a little further uh, and they might have good feedback for you and they kind of know more about what you're going through. That is excellent advice. And so speaking of mentorship, speaking of teaching, uh, given your history of pursuing multiple roles, I guess it's no surprise that in addition to your work with the WRF, and, and you mentioned this in your intro, you're all, you also joined the faculty at two of UW schools uh business and pharmacy what prompted this um entry into teaching yeah so i was i was really um excited about creating a, a class where um you would learn just sort of that you'd be you, you would learn what you didn't know so you'd say like okay what let's cover all these different areas that you have to have to start a company in the life sciences and go over them at a really high level, and then you can do deep dives on them later. Like, what's a way to just have a buffet of that to start off with? Um, you know, regulatory, IP, venture investing, because just having gone through it myself and trying to learn it, I just thought there's got to be a better way to have this just um, laid out in a logical format for folks. Um, and there are a couple classes at UW that did that to some respect, but, you know, some were more geared towards we're doing the engineering problem around it, or we are solely focused on like the marketing aspect of it. And so I wanted to have one that that was um, open to people from a lot of different backgrounds. Yeah. And so just, I spent, again, I spent, you know, a couple years talking with folks in different parts of UW. I talked with folks at other schools that are in the Seattle area, trying to see if there was a fit for me to do that. Um, had, you know, wrote a couple of different syllabi for different courses, different institutions. and eventually landed with um, Emer Dooley at UW. And so she's been a, a mentor who's popped up for me during a lot of really critical parts of my life. And she had a seminar she was teaching um, in the Foster School of Business that was geared towards preparing students for uh, kind of like, it was called, it's called the Health Innovation Practicum, but it's effectively a business plan competition for healthcare and life sciences. So people are doing that competition and they're showing up with their posters People were asking them, are you a 510K or PMA? And they didn't know what that meant. Or like, what's your IP strategy? They didn't know. So they wanted to have a course that prepared people uh, for that route. And she had set up as a seminar, so there were speakers each week, uh, but she wanted to pass it on to someone else. And she also, we kind of were brainstorming about, we thought it might be good to have some didactic component to it. And just because I'd done it, my, I had to learn that myself, I wanted to make that, um, learning curve a little lower for the people coming after me. And so I thought I could help with that. Um, I didn't have any 
pedagogical training on how to do that, but I just felt really convicted that this course needed to exist. And um, so I took that on. I've been doing it for a couple of years now, and that's been just a brilliantly fun experience. And so the, the students um, come from a range of backgrounds. We have undergrads, we have uh, MBA students, um, we have people that are in the evening MBA who might be healthcare practitioners like nurses or doctors, and we have PhD students from the sciences. And so if you imagine all those people together in the same room trying to create company ideas together, you get a, a good variety of stuff. And it's also just a really good way for me to exploit my friends and colleagues because I, I want them to come in and speak to the class and people yeah. want to help students. And so it's, and I learned from those talks too. So um, like, I remember we had one um, seminar from Claudia Mitchell. So she was the CEO of Universal Cells, which was acquired by Estellas. She was a, it was a phenomenal success. And then she went on to run uh, Estellas' um, partnership strategy for a number of years. But she talked, she basically talked through her story and she was a, a tenured faculty in France. Uh, she wanted to go into industry. So she um, left that to get a PhD, which seems like a crazy thing to do to actually leave a tenured faculty position where you can basically stay in that for the rest of your life. Um, mm -hmm. She came to the U.S. to start a company um, and a technology she's very excited about. And for a number of reasons that completely failed. Um, and then she started the next company and um, raised a little bit of capital and was able to... Um, basically build off of industry partnerships and to a point where it was acquired and that she just took off from there. And so it was this really interesting story about this kind of circuitous path that she took to get there. And so just having a chance to hear stories like that has just it's been really, really cool. Oh, it's absolutely phenomenal. And it sounds like a great compliment and as well to the community building work. You talked about supporting early stage founders, helping promote the next generation, help them understand what the entrepreneurial space is like and how do you translate ideas into actual companies? Yeah, and we have like CEOs come in and talk to the students. And I, tr I, I in, in thinking about the balance of folks to come in, I tr try to err on the side of people that have just spun out. So it's, you know, again, it's like hard to relate to someone who is several decades ahead of you. Like it just seems so inaccessible. But if there's someone who is a year or two after graduation taking the risk of launching a company and what does that look like and what kinds of things are they doing? It just makes it, it makes it seem more accessible for people too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I try to, there's the, there's just teaching people, okay, what are the, what, what's, what is a patent? And there's other things about like just seeing stories and people having access to role models that they can see like, oh, this isn't as crazy an idea as you might think. Oh, I love that. So jumping a little bit back to your investment work, the WRF seeks to concentrate funding on research that addresses important needs, as you mentioned, in healthcare and in other critical areas that will have positive outcomes in Washington State and ideally beyond, particularly in therapeutics, diagnostics, and healthcare delivery. And so as you mentioned, this is done through both grants and WRF's capital uh, direct investments into startups. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how healthcare and the life sciences come into this picture of investing in the future of Washington State? Yeah, so we're investing here in Washington. So we're you know, a lot of VCs, they're taking a national approach. They might have theses about like, okay, we're interested in platforms that do X, Y, or Z. And so they're setting like hypotheses about that. We're, our funnel's limited by what's around us. And so we take a different approach and we're thinking about what is our state uniquely good at or what are we, what could we be really good at? Um, and so that's not gonna be everything. Um, so we're thinking about where are the things where we're already showing excellence and we can be, we can help raise that up even further. So uh, Institute for Protein Design is a great example. That's, uh, they've, they've done phenomenally well. You know, um, almost 10 years ago now, we gave them a large grant to help do what's called a cluster hire. So bringing a lot of faculty members to work under one PI. So you have to have a center of gravity of people working together. Uh, and we also created a, uh, funded a postdoc fellowship program underneath them as well. So thinking about how do you build the people around someone who's already doing good work, and in this case, David Baker, uh, and that has paid off dividends over time. So that brought in people and you start to get this center of gravity that starts to build over time. And so a lot of it is this community building and also reflecting on, well, there's this thing that's really special here. It's unique. Uh, it could be something more, but it needs a little bit of help through some rough parts. Uh, and we can be there for that. So it's not... Um, 
like pouring rocket fuel in different ships. It's like, what are the, what are the things where it's a sticking point where we can be uh, help break that clear? Uh, and just, we just need to, to get them through this rough patch to get them, to get them off. Um, so that's or maybe of, they need a bit of CapEx to accelerate ahead. And like you were saying about the cluster yeah. containers, the postdoc fellowship. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's kind of how we're thinking about it, but we're not going to be able to artificially make Washington state good at something where they're not, there's an already resident expertise. And so it's more about thinking, you know, what's, what are the places where we could um, help accelerate what's already there? And so talking about that acceleration, what are some of the types of projects that WRF grants uh, cover? So um, our grants, we try to be really responsive and flexible. So uh, the things that we do, we're getting back to people in like four to six weeks on funding from when their first application comes in. So people really appreciate that as a chance to uh, come in. And it's also more nimble and responsive. Like if you're applying to NIH grants for something, it can take like half a year. And the other part is we try to have um, real, real flexibility what that can go towards. And so what you fund is highly variable in what a project needs. Um, and oftentimes it's not just um, the basic mechanism proving it's like manufacturability or we need a consultant um, to help us with um, uh, an IP review or to, to different strategies like it, it can change or uh, human factors testing or all sorts of things. So we, we try to be responsive for what the investigators need, be quick in, in time, and then also not have a one size fits all approach. Um, and uh, it's also open-ended, I think is another thing that's really interesting. So it's not just PIs who are applying. We have folks, we've had applications from PhD students, um, postdocs, uh, PIs. And so we want the money to support the people that are doing the work. And we, you know, good ideas can come from anywhere. And so we want to make it open so that people can get support and um, we can help those projects. Oh, that's phenomenal. And so on the WRF capital side, you're often the first money in and you regularly partner with both angels and VCs. Can you share a little bit more about your operating scope uh, on the capital investment side? Yeah, so um, there's, we have the, so a lot, a lot of things we invest in have a grant in the past. And so we've had time to get our heads around uh, if this worked out, would it, would it make a difference? Would it be a big deal? Um, and so we, we've, we've done the scientific diligence over the course of years in some cases. And it's about like, when, are, when is the right mixture there in terms of uh, the science is proven, they have an idea of where they're gonna point technology, like you're, you're familiar, like you have a platform technology, the first couple applications are really critical. Uh, and so we figure out like, okay, what is this gonna be better at than anything else? And then also is the right team in place to get it there? And so sometimes it can take a while of dating other founders, you know, like saying like, we have a scientific founder, they might need a business founder, or, you know, it might need a complement in terms of, um, the different people you want at the table uh, to start off with. Uh, and so getting that sort of mixture there is really critical. And so uh, we sometimes lead, sometimes syndicate, uh, but we've, we're, we're trying to make sure that it, it's checking those boxes for us uh, in terms of, yes, science is compelling and strong. It's an area that is compelling. It's a growing market. And we think this has the look and feel of something that is VC scale. So the other challenge is there's a lot of opportunities out there where they could be a great business for a half dozen, two dozen people. It could have SBARs, it could have positive revenue, but it's not good for the founders or us if they're taking on VC, but they're not gonna have a, a certain scale or sort of mul multiple of growth. And yeah. so being upfront and honest with them about that is also really critical. Uh, and that requires a lot of counseling. So it's it's hard to, you just hear the stories of VC and you see the news about that, but there are a lot of people who are doing really good work in small companies where it doesn't make sense to do that. So a lot of it's just kind of coaching and counseling those founders too and trying to find the best fit for them. That all makes a lot of sense. And given your grants are so open-ended, how do you think about uh, where to invest? And or maybe a better question is, how, how do you develop uh, your investment theses? What are some of the topic areas you're investing in today? Yeah, so I think that, you know, we are pretty, the grants were very open-ended, right? So we're, we're not expecting any financial return. Um, it can, it can, we have a portfolio of things where some are more incremental improvements, uh, but near term, and some are higher risk, but 
uh, could be really transformative if they worked out. So we're trying to balance the portfolio of grants uh, to reflect some near-term low-risk projects and some um, sort of moonshot high-risk projects because you don't want to have one way or the other uh, for all of those. Um, and so that's how we kind of think about um, balancing that. And then on the, um, yeah, so that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of the balance of stuff on the granting side. That all makes a lot of sense. And so building on that, while you are Washington focused, you and your team have made some really phenomenal investments, as you've said. There's great companies out there, uh, such as Juno and Absci, A Alpha Bio, Phase Genomics. How do you, when you're assessing some of these companies up front, really separate um, signal from the norms as you're evaluating companies? What are some of the criteria you're considering beyond, as you were talking about earlier, just that uh, VC return profile? Yeah, so I think that one thing we look for is the credibility of the science. I think a lot of people can have a pitch deck or here's where I want to go or like, here's what this will be once I get it built out. But it's really special when you can see someone who's like, okay, I know how to make validate this and see if it's proven. And they're really, they're phenomenal scientists. And they've kind of gone through those steps to show this is not just a hypothesis, like they really need to scale it. And so um, I love the team at Phase Genomics. They had just really compelling technology. They were working in a lab when they started off. And it was at a point where they had so many partnerships with the lab that they couldn't keep it in the lab anymore. And so Ivan uh, Leachko, the CEO, had to spin out a company because he, he was basically just told by his PI, there's not space for you to keep on doing this stuff in the lab. You got to go spin it out and do it. And so that's, <laughs> that's how I got started with it. So it's kind of like this natural um, market pull to have him come out. And then we looked at it and it was like, oh, the IP is differentiated. There's lots of places we can go. The problems he's trying to solve here are, are really big. Um, and then there's another element of you can see and people uh, when they're high performing and they beat your expectations. So um, like David Younger, for example, a lot left with A Alpha Bio, there was a lot to prove on that technology but you just saw how his evolutionary cycle was so much shorter than everyone else's. And so he was doing a poster at the Science Engineering Business Association, which is like a student group on campus. And then all of a sudden he's getting VC investments a year later. And like you go to bio and like people are asking you about David Younger and Alpha Bio. So like, here's someone that had no experience uh, going around and pitching VCs. They're a PhD student, but you could just like, that you could see the energy that he brought to it. And just all of a sudden you saw the results of he's getting out there, he's navigating the situation, which uh, he was totally unfamiliar with. So he's obviously, you know, high horsepower and really flexible. And just for that demonstration of someone's uh, passion and eagerness is really convicting. Same, we saw the same kind of thing with Ivan. Someone's built a company with no experience or background in the space um, and just shown that they can do it. And that's kind of, that's given us a lot of uh, eagerness to get involved with um, scientist founders. You know, you can see some people who just have a different pace and a certain sort of energy and excitement around what they're doing. And so that kind of, okay, so, so we're thinking about companies like that pattern of the science is strong, it's in an area that's growing, and this is a technology to make a huge difference. And the final part is the most ephemeral, which is just saying like, oh, I don't know what this person's going to do, but they're going to do something really big because you can just like see how driven they are and they they, they get things done. And that th that combination of different ingredients, it really makes for something special. No, absolutely. And so not every founder is going to have worked with WRF on a grant before. Not every founder is going to have so many uh, clients they can't keep in their PI's lab. Do you have any recommendations for founders who are trying to spin out technologies and who are reaching out to uh, yourself or your team? I think the biggest piece of advice is just make sure you talk to people. I think scientists oftentimes try to just fully bake something in their head uh, and then present it as a fully formed thing to the world. And then in companies and entrepreneurship, it is a lot of feedback and iteration and having things build on each other. And so I would say like, talk to as many people as you can and see what el what kernels of truth you can find in there. Um, things are more likely to be smothered by holding them too closely than die because you're putting them out into the world. And so I think there's like an element of letting go of a little bit of control where you're talking to people about the basic idea, gain feedback and using that to form, make the, make the idea better. 
Um, and that's the part that I think a lot of people really struggle with because there, you know, there's certain things you should never share, like you shouldn't share your protein sequence or things like IP like that. But the basic concept of what you're doing, there are a lot of people out there that want to help you, but if you don't give them enough to really understand what you're trying to do, they can't give you valuable feedback. And so people that there's like that evolutionary cycle for like, here's business model version one and here's business model version two. You can take that from months to years down to days to weeks just by increasing the number of people you get feedback from. And so I think just getting out there, talking to people, uh, making that better. And then you circle back with them and you say, you know, I took your, I got your feedback. Here's the, here's the improvement on that. And um, you, you can just see the, the difference that makes uh, in people and their ideas. No, it's absolutely critical. And that's really phenomenal advice, especially, um, and for those listening, there's a reason it's called a non-confidential deck, as we were <laughs> saying. Uh, start up front with a higher level description. Maybe you, if you'd like to share some key results that really prove the validity of the experiments you've been doing in the science, we'd love to see that. But don't ask for an NDA off the bat. Uh, it's, go ahead, Will. Yeah, no, I think that people, um, you have to sell people and get them excited about it. And I think also just reading the room about like, okay, if I'm telling someone the idea for why this is a big idea and I've gone through 20 people and no one seems excited about that, like also, is that because I haven't framed it right? Or is that because this isn't the right idea for me to bet on too? And so I think just, yeah, having that like non-confidential deck, you get it out there and you see how people respond to it is really critical. So pivoting slightly, and I mean, we've been talking about this the whole time, but I'd love to dive deeper into WRF's platform of support for founders, especially as you previously mentioned that and when you were in the startup side, when you were at uh, UW as a student, you viewed VCs as gatekeepers. And then you saw that when you were on the investing side, you noticed uh, nothing could be further from the truth if you're doing venture right. So what does being a good partner to your portfolio companies mean to you? Yeah, so I think that, you know, I'll start off with when I was starting in VC, I was also a PhD student. So I had like my PhD studies at night and I was doing the VC work during the day. And so I had that experience of like how, when I did email from my UW PhD account, I would get like a very different response than when I emailed from my WF Seattle account. And so I know the, um, for, you know, when you have, when you wear that label or you have serving that function, like you just get treated very differently. People respond to you very differently. Uh, and so there's an element of like, you want to be helpful. You want to give feedback, but you also want to know that someone's not just blowing smoke. They're actually, you're actually being helpful and you're trying to actually see if you're doing quality work. But, um, and so you can, when you're giving feedback, is it feedback the company is actually using and is helpful? And that's when I think there's a good marriage. And so, um, the thing that I've learned over time is that, uh, companies go through really tough times and it's not just always like placing a bet and walking away. Um, there are challenges with uh, low cash and runway concerns or a uh, competitor comes out with something that looks remarkably similar and you have to figure out how, how it's differentiated. And if, if, if it's a good relationship, it is something where the investor is going to have something valuable to say and add to that conversation. And the entrepreneur wants to come to them and hear their thoughts on it because they like, it's just been helpful and useful uh, over a period of time. And so it's something you, 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 um, grow and discover. It's not just because they want the next check that comes later down the road. You can kind of just tell like, okay, if who's someone I'd want to be in the trenches with, and I want on my side, regardless of if there is a check or not. And that's kind of the best situation. I think that if you can find that situation where, gosh, this person would, I would, I would love to have them even as an advisor, uh, and I'm not just looking at them and just as a check, that's the best situation. So, um, when we're working with companies, it kind of goes from the very start to the finish, right? So from the start, um, how much money you're raising and why, what are you doing that for? Who are you going to, what's the right, uh, partnership? Like who, what are the first key critical hires? And so it's being a sounding board for writing feedback because you've seen, you know, as a VC, you're going to see hundreds of different companies. You're going to be an investor in dozens. And hopefully there's a pattern recognition that comes from that. If you've seen things go multiple ways and someone who's like, uh, head down barreling through with their specific business model, you know, it's just, it's a helpful compliment to have someone who's seen multiple different versions play out multiple different scenarios and give feedback on that. So I think that kind of conversation of like depth from the entrepreneur and then breadth from the investor, uh, gives good feedback. Uh, and then, you know, also thinking about just networking, helping be a node for your companies. Mm -hmm. 
whatever reason, there's a lot of, um, you know, people really qualified people when they're looking for gigs, they'll reach out to VCs and say, here's my skill set. And then we're trying to plug them into companies. And so there's, you know, probably 20, 30% of my job is just recruiting and matchmaking uh, for portfolio companies. And that's something I wouldn't have thought that I would, uh, was a skill set I would have to gain, but it makes a huge difference um, for folks because it, it gets the company's access to a different pool of talent that might've been there. And then finally, you know, like on just like the economics and um, market sizing and valuations and what's what's fair kind of questions. Um, after you're an investor, you're you're a good advocate for them because you can help determine um, what they should be getting. Um, and then you can always, I, I always encourage companies to use me as the bad guy when they're negotiating, you know, like, oh, we can't, we can't, there's no way that they would let us get away with this because of X, Y, or Z. So thinking about like, how can you advocate for them and get them better arrangements because you're seeing multiple different um, deals go through, or you've seen different arrangements or different structures, just having that kind of experience and um, breadth of things that you see can be really useful. Yeah, I love that there at the end, uh, use me as the bad guy. I might, might borrow that in the future. <laughs> Diving back into what you were saying about spending 20, even 30% of your time uh, assisting with talent and in recruiting and hiring and matchmaking. As we think about the lengthy life cycle of life science companies, it, especially the fact that you get involved so early when they're even still uh, many times, it sounds like an idea in academia that are being moved towards commercialization. It can be really important upfront to include and think about diversity, equity, and inclusion of people like the founders, the boards, the teams. And so given you see and support companies from these earliest stages, do you have any thoughts on how we as VCs can provide support for the individuals who are so busy spending time uh, founding these companies? Yeah, I think that um, it's a huge question. It's a huge question, it's a huge problem. And then um, you, we know the facts, like company, you know, companies, teams, they're more diverse, have better outcomes. And so um, everyone's trying to solve for that problem. Um, and thinking about like how we do that individually, um, I just try to ask myself questions. So when I uh, say no to a founder, it's the question of, am I saying, would, would I say no if this was a different kind of person? And just saying is like checking yourself for that kind of bias if you're making those decisions is really important. Like would I take a risk on a first time founder if they had a different profile? Uh, and what about and what about their profiles causing me to feel discomfort? And is that is that reasonable or not reasonable? Um, the other thing we think about is just asking the question again, uh, are there really no women candidates you could have on your board? Um, you know, is that it, there really is no one we can find this in the Seattle area or even nationally around that. So there's, there's always some lines so of thinking, just thinking a little harder when you look at a list and you say like, okay, who would we want to recommend for this role? And have we thought hard enough about who's qualified? Uh, are we just going with um, sort of who comes to mind instantaneously? Because like who comes to mind the first minute is, is really leaning on some of those things that um, are more irrational in our mind. Um, and so I think like asking ourselves that question, like when we send, when I send recommendations to folks for board members or advisors, I create a list. I just say, is there, uh, I look at it and I say, okay, is this, does this seem fair? And if I thought a little longer, would I, would I remember someone who wasn't um, the standard phenotype for a, a, a board member or a, um, a founder? And you can have some really great connections that way by just not always doing the fast thinking, but doing a little slow thinking about who would be a great addition uh, to a team uh, to have, but they're just not the stereotype people are used to seeing. And so just kind of slowing, slowing the thinking down a little bit and making sure you're asking the question at those steps of like, am I being fair? Have I thought of everyone who, who would be reasonable for this? And have I at least tried? Uh, I think that's how we, we, we tend to think about it. Well, that's a great set of recommendations for all of us to keep in mind. And so jumping uh, over to think about maybe catalyzing bio-innovation more broadly. From the beginning of your career, you've had a very future-forward perspective. You've very much charted your own course, often at the intersection of medicine, policy, economics, and innovation. And so what have you been seeing from founders that has you excited in terms of the next cycle of emerging technologies? Yeah, so on a technology front, I think that uh, 
technology data enabled improvements in biology. I think that just the, the slow throughput approach uh, was reliable, um, but just thinking about ways that that, there, that exist to accelerate that. Um, so like the, the, all of the programs we're thinking out of the Institute for Protein Design, mm -hmm. uh, companies like A-Alpha, where you can just increase the throughput of discovery. And I think you just give, you're seeing a generational shift in how we're doing um, drug discovery and development where it's not just this um, high throughput screening, huge, the bigger the library, the better the outcome kind of approach. Think about how we work backwards from the problem we're trying to solve as opposed to trying to make um, make a solution fit and find the right application for that. So I think that problem, we're starting to get closer to the tech model, which is let's start with the problem, the actual need, and then work backwards from there as opposed to trying to push forward biology when it may not be working all the time. So I think that's a huge shift. Um, and just think about how we use these really these powerful tools in a way that um, is at, at the end of the day going to create a clinically meaningful solution. So it can't be, you have to have that sort of really cool science and the approach, but if you can't, if you can't reduce it down to um, what, what therapy or diagnostic is it going to be at the end of the day, and is that a big enough market, then that's a problem too. So I think that that's how we're you know, thinking about how we, how we leverage these big tools and big technologies, these platforms, and then have them in, in a place where we can actually have line of sight to what that application is going to be. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, I mean, we're obviously excited about tech bio here at Alix and at BIOS, and it's something where, as you say, I fingers crossed, I'm hoping that as we go more high throughput, we'll eventually reach a point where we can shift even from drug discovery to drug design. And I mm -hmm. think that's going to be a really powerful transition in the next, uh, hopefully, decade. But turning things around, we've talked about what you're excited by. Is there anything you think might need a bit more time before it's really ready? Um, ready for the market, ready for commercialization front time? Um, I see a lot of companies that, that are, they have like a new way of discovering some biological insight, but they have no idea what it's going to be used for. And there's just this approach, well, we can get this new kind of data and we can get huge amounts of this new kind of data and we can see as biological uh, mechanism or insight for all, you know, and th there's different variations of this theme, but it's this tons of data approach. And there are a lot of people in the tech space who are jumping on that and saying, well, we know data, we know information, we can we can find meaningfulness there. But then it's not thinking about, okay, who's gonna, who cares? Like, you know, when you have this, you have all this data, what are you gonna do with that? And how is that actually gonna end of the day, end of the day make a diagnostic or a therapeutic or a patient's experience better? And mm -hmm. if you can't, I think that not have, just doing that sort of data first, um, high throughput with no understanding of what it's used for is is really problematic. And we've seen companies that have that approach and the valuations are wild, so out of bounds of what, what you'd think would be reasonable and there's no application in sight. And that gets, that's a, that's a hard model to pull yourself back from. So I think that always, you know, you have to have that sort of big picture approach of our platform is impressive. It can do all these different things, but what are we going to actually do to figure out where, how this is going to be a product or a service people are going to pay for? Um, that's the, that's the part that some, I think, missed the jump on. Yeah, and I think your point around uh, runaway valuations, I mean, we've seen a pullback in the public markets at this point, and that's trickled back down into the privates as well. And as we think about it, it's not always great for uh, the, even the startups to be taking such um high level valuations because then they do have to live up to them. And it's not always easy to find an exit at that point, be it the public market or an acquisition. So yeah, no, we've had tough conversations with companies that kind of let that get out of control. And so it's always better, I think, to think about okay, what are the what are the incremental steps you could have in the meantime to test this out? And it's better for the founders too, because you're going to say like, okay, we're going to take a small amount of money, prove something out, but we're going to get less diluted and we're going to be far more valuable and also going to know what we're doing. Uh, the next step. So I, I, am generally more of an advocate. I mean, it's, oh, it would be not, it'd be really nice, right? If you were an entrepreneur and a founder have all that money, you have two, three years of financing ahead of you. It's, that's a really hard thing to say no to, but it's not the end of the world to not have that because, um, you see companies that spend the cycles, like trying to figure out, okay, how do you make this case? What's the next incremental step? And they become much more, um, downturn proof 
because they actually have something people are willing to pay for. So I think the ones that have that kind of like hype and um, uh, cycle built up around them, those are the ones you see crashing so immediately when things start to go south. And so kind of building the fundamentals back into a biotech business is becoming vogue again. Uh, but that's kind of how, you know, people have been trying to do it for a while. So I think trying to think about, okay, reducing back to first principles, how are we going to use an interesting area of science to make a product or a service um, is kind of the key thing we try to think about. That's a great, great point. And so before we come to a close, a few rapid fire questions just to count things up. Uh, first and foremost, what's coming next for the WRF? Yeah, no, so we have um, we've expanded our amount of VC investing. We're going that forward. And then our next step is to start taking a leadership role in more deals. And so we were at a point where uh, we were getting really excited about some companies, but we sent them off to find their own term sheets. And sometimes that worked out, sometimes it didn't. Um, and so now we're actually taking a leadership role, setting terms, leading more seed stage deals, and trying to help bridge these great technologies and companies that we're seeing early level to a point where they can get larger series A's. And so really stepping into the gap that we identified the market there. Um, and so we're starting to build that out, doing two to three um, leadership positions and seed stage deals per year. And so hopefully we'll start to see momentum from that build over time, you know, three deals per year. Um, over 10 years is 30, you know, prosperous biotech companies in the Seattle, Seattle Washington area uh, over the next 10 years. And so that's kind of what we'd hope to see. Yeah, it sounds like you're going to keep building a phenomenal ecosystem. And drawing a little bit more on your background, especially around healthcare economics, I'd just be curious your thoughts at this moment in biotech, especially with the um, markets being where they are and valuations starting to change. You have a bit of an economics background. You've been in venture. Curious your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I bristle when people start to get upset about like the value-based pricing models. I think a lot of the work we do is really geared to we, we could be exploiting that and benefiting from that. We're creating technologies that are curative and have huge health benefits. And I think that we have to think about how we can work with the new model for pricing as opposed to have reactionary responses to it because it's a little more nuanced than it's good for us or it's bad for us. Um, like when you think about models and systems like the NHS in the UK, they do health economics and value-based pricing for every drug that comes over there. And they had a much faster approval time and they, uh, for Civaldi, for example, than the U.S. did. So they saw, oh, we can pay more money up front to have long-term benefits for patients. We would gladly do that because we can actually see that benefit. And so I think that we have to be thinking about how we are going to demonstrate and quantify the value these treatments are making. And we can thrive in sort of the new environment ecosystem mm -hmm. that some of the, um, that is coming out. So like demonizing groups like ICER and people are trying to do health economics, I think is, in, you know, not, is, is, is the wrong approach. I think that thinking about, instead of trying to say like, oh, there's other benefits other than health economics, just how do we quantify what we're doing and the value to people because it's there. And if we use that, those metrics in terms of uh, downstream cost offsets, that might also help us think about where's the best way for us to spend our time right now. So if we did that exercise, we said, oh, if we have a therapy that can come out in the space, but it's incremental, there's four other therapies there. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, we, we could, are there other places we could point this technology where it would have a bigger impact on patients and outcomes? And so I think just thinking about how we use that compass from health economics to pick projects and um, direct our efforts is really critical. I think it's going to be, the ship's going to be slow to turn, but we're going to eventually have to get there. I would think we could have a whole hour's conversation or more just on that topic. Yeah. So maybe next time. Um, we've talked a lot about the professional today. Before we jump off, we'd love to talk about something maybe a little bit more personal. Uh, in 2018, you were profiled by a publication called Geek of the Week, which is a title I absolutely love. And in the interview, you made a number of insightful points, but one of them you talked about, and you mentioned this earlier, being from Tennessee, uh, you say you love to uh, debate the merits of different styles of barbecue. And so in addition, maybe to different types of barbecue, uh, how do you like to spend your free time? Well, there's no debate. Um, so uh, North Carolina pulled pork is the best kind of barbecue. Um, but okay. but yeah. In my free time, we, Washington is really one of the most amazing places for the outdoors. Um, so the mountains here are absolutely gorgeous. The 
when you, when you travel, like you, you just realize, I realize more and more like what Washington is really good at. And what we're really good at is um, parks, playgrounds, the outdoors, the state parks here are amazing. Um, and so try to spend a lot of time um, outdoors. I have four young kids. Uh, and so we get them hiking. Um, we are, um, we snowshoe, we get out, we just get outdoors and um, it's really healthy um, for everyone. I, I find for me, for me too, just like be in a different space, be outdoors when uh, I just get naturally more sort of calm down. I'm surrounded by green and trees and those kinds of things. And so I need that to, to keep me going. And so I'm really lucky to be in a place like Washington where it's just so naturally beautiful. I can't wait to visit. And it sounds like you get an opportunity to work off that North Carolina pulled pork too. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, before we do wrap up, do you have any closing thoughts, shameless plugs, entirely open to you here? No, I would say like, um, yeah, if you're one shameless plug. So if you're a student um, thinking about your next steps, like just get out there and start talking to people. Like it's never uh, too late and um, use your student card while you have it because people want to help you and don't be afraid to try something new. No, that's a great recommendation. And thank you again, Will, for an absolutely fantastic episode. I'm very excited to learn more about the WRF and your own journey to BC, your thoughts on the space. Thank you again. No, so great to connect with you and thank you for the opportunity.